I was thrilled when uh, Senator Gilry offered to come and be on the program. And I was thrilled because uh, Senator Gilry is a very remarkable man. He's also become somewhat famous uh, in the last few months for uh, he switched from the Democrat Party to the Republican Party. And as you can, will be able to tell when he stands up, he's an African American, and so he's now the. What, what are you, Senator? You're the first African American Republican statewide elected official, something like that, in the legislature. And he made a video to explain to his constituents, he's from Opelousas, why he made that switch. And it went up on YouTube. You know, it went, it went viral over a million hits. Very eloquent, eloquent speaker. But you know, you can be famous without being remarkable. Justin Bieber's famous. <laughs> Kardashians are famous. But I don't consider them remarkable. What I think about is remarkable about Senator Gillery, uh, his mother just passed away, 104 just a couple months ago. Born, born and raised in Opelousas. In an era before civil rights. He was arrested when he was a young man, 15 years old. His crime was trying to check out a book from the public library. That was his crime. It didn't deter him from learning. He went on to graduate college. He went on to law school at Rutgers University, an outstanding school, and to teach law on their faculty. He remained active in civil rights. He served on the Civil Rights Commission for the Governor of Maryland, for the Mayor of Seattle. And after he came back to Opelousas, he's been very involved in both civil rights activity church and community activities, as well as being elected senator as a Democrat. Can't tell you how thrilled I am to have him with the Republicans. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you the distinguished, the eloquent, and the dapper <laughs> Senator <laughs> It is an honor to stand before you this evening. A few minutes ago, the governor talked about, about the American dream. And as he talked about it, I was listening and, and reliving moments in my own life from the cotton fields and corn fields of Lawtel to standing before you this evening. It has been a remarkable ride, a great gift from my, from my creator. That American dream is very important to all of us. And so when, when it was publicized that I was going to be here this evening, some people, I got more than two dozen telephone calls to talk, to share with you some information that I have about an analysis that I have about the American dream and how well our present administration is protecting the American dream that's so important to all of us. My mother spent 44 years as a classroom teacher and a, and a principal. My dad, who died at 102, was also an educator among a whole bunch of other things, including, including being a bootlegger. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> I have to give you both sides of it. Both of them were educators. And as you know, I spent some time in the classroom. And so 
this education thing is, is important to us. We, we bleed education. And, and what teachers do is to analyze performance and, and give grades. And that's what I'm going to do this evening. I have prepared an, what I call the American Dream Report Card. I've given, I've chosen several topics, several subjects, and I would like to discuss those subjects with you and so that we together can analyze the performance of the present administration. Without further ado, let me get right into it. <clears throat> One of the most important things about the American dream is justice. Now, some months ago, there was a young man who was killed, a young black man, his name was Trayvon Martin, he was killed in Florida. The president stepped right up and he said, I demand justice for Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin looks like my sons would look if I had sons. And so he sent people from the Justice Department down to Florida to guarantee justice for Trayvon Martin. A few months later, a young Australian student was killed. Most people don't know his name. It was Christopher Lane. Now, Christopher Lane, Australian, looks like my sons. I have sons. That Lane looks like my sons. A little paler than my sons. <laughs> but he has two legs and two arms and two eyes and a heart, just like my sons have. And so I was waiting for the president to step out and say, I want justice. For Christopher Lane. And so I waited. And I waited. And I'm still waiting. If justice is determined by the color of one's skin, we are in deep trouble. If the value of, of human life determined by this thin layer of melanin that can be scratched off. If human life and the value of human life is determined by that, we are in deep trouble. We are a nation divided and we will fall. We cannot stand. So Mr. President, for failing to protect justice, I give you an F. You have earned an F. Now, the American dream stands on, on three pillars. Two of those pillars are jobs and education. So let's look at how well this administration has done with respect to jobs. This administration has created thousands, tens of thousands of new jobs. They've built new roads, new highways, new public works projects. Problem is that they've done that in foreign lands. While our bridges and highways crumble, while our workers go unemployed. So, Mr. President, if I were in one of those foreign lands where you spent billions of American dollars creating jobs for people over there, if I were there, I would give you an A. Unfortunately, I'm an American, and so. You've earned another F with respect to job creation in America. <laughs> Education is something that's very valuable to us here in Louisiana. You heard the speaker talk about what we have done in Louisiana to lift education up. And now, and he's correct, people across this country are looking to see how Louisiana has done to reform education and lift up education. One of those things is that we've created a voucher program. Now, in the voucher program, we're talking about 8,000 slots. 8,000 kids who can take our education money and go down the street or across town to a good school, a safe environment, a school that's productive, and get an education. Now, you know that I'm a, a child of the Civil Rights Movement. 
When I was a boy, thugs wearing white sheets, tobacco stained white sheets, thugs crawled out of Louisiana's backwoods and stood in the doorways of schoolhouses in Louisiana to prevent little kids from getting an education. Today, thugs wearing Brooks Brothers suits crawl out of the halls of government in Washington, D.C. And they stand in the doorways of schoolhouses in Louisiana trying to destroy that voucher program to send 8,000 little children back into some of the poorest performing schools in America. For that, Mr. President, you earned a Z, but I can only give you an F. Prayer has been an important part of America. Since we began, it was America and God. God and America. So how is this administration protecting prayer? How well are they doing? Let's see. There was a government shutdown not long ago. And during that shutdown, Catholic priests were prevented from saying mass and prevented from serving communion to our armed forces members. Can you imagine that now? A priest being ordered by the government not to say mass and not to serve communion. And of course, many Christian organizations are listed as terrorist organizations by our military now. So I would have to say that this administration is not well protected prayer but that they have earned an F when it comes to protecting prayer. But what about the Second Amendment? What about our guns? You know, we Louisianans love our guns. I'm a gun boy, too. There have been some shootings in this, in this country. And every time there's a shooting, our president has taken to the airwaves radio and television and he has talked about how terrible guns are and he's tried to limit gun ownership and the sizes of guns and the sizes of bullets and the number of bullets you can have in a gun and the number of bullets you can have at your house and if there was a shooting tomorrow in Mooseville, Montana of a moose this president would use that shooting to try to limit gun ownership problem is that guns are not the problem. Guns are not responsible for the violence. Guns are not responsible for the shootings. A gun is an inanimate object. If you set it down here, it's going to stay there until someone picks it up and does something with it. It's just a tool. The problem, my brothers and sisters, is the culture of violence. If you take, for example, a three-year-old child Mama doesn't feel like being bothered. Daddy's gone. You stick the child in front of a television blaring violent video games and you let this child for a decade play violent video games. A decade, a decade passes. Now you have a 13 year old who has been programmed to kill. His only response is to kill, to shoot. He hasn't learned anything else. If there's some discomfort in his life, he will kill it. And so you now have a 13-year-old. Actually, you have a whole lot of 13-year-olds who are violent. And when something happens, they attempt to kill it. You see, it's not the gun. It's the culture of violence. If we take away all of the guns today, tonight there will be killings. They'll use knives. They'll use sticks and stones. They'll use bricks. But it's the culture of killing that is responsible for the violence in America and not guns. For failing to protect our gun rights. For failing to even begin to address, not one time, for failing to not once address the culture of violence. Mr. President, you have earned an F.
millions of babies every year are killed in their mother's wombs for advancing that murder, for protecting that murderous system. Mr. President, you've earned an F, and when you reach upstairs and you have to face our maker, I pray for your soul because he may give you an F also. Well, let's talk about foreign policy. Surely he's, he's, he's done pretty well there. Uh, let's see. Are we safer today here in America? Are American interests safer overseas today? No. He worked hard to push the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring has turned into the American nightmare. We have spent more of our treasury, more of our dollars, and more of our children's blood pursuing a nutty policy in the Middle East where we are not safer here and we are not safer there. We're not safer when we travel. For foreign policy, Mr. President has earned an F. There's an old expression. Uh, most of you are too young to remember it. It's as sound as a dollar bill. <laughs> you young folks aren't familiar with that because you haven't heard it lately. Because lately, the dollar bill has not been sound. But a long time ago when I was a boy, you would hear people talk about as sound as a dollar bill all of the time. It was a statement about American fiscal soundness, about our economic stability. We were strong and we were powerful economically. Our dollar was the world standard. Today we owe nearly 20 trillion dollars. Now, at your house, if you spend twice as much money as you take in, you're going bankrupt. Well, that's the same thing with a nation, except the nation can pr print money. And that's what we're doing. We're printing and printing and printing money. And we have a president who says, he does not say, stop the spending. Let's cut the spending. Let's pay down the debt. What he says instead is, raise the debt level. Raise the debt ceiling. It's only 17 trillion. We can raise it up to 18 and a half tomorrow for that fiscal irresponsibility that puts at risk the futures of every American, particularly the futures of our children. Mr. President, you have earned an F. Now, I know that a lot of you, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Elbert Guillory, you just chose a bunch of topics where our president would not do well. You just want to bash a good man. Well, that's not true. Not only, as you can see from my honest face, but not only is my face that honest, but in my heart. I'm, I'm a fair and balanced kind of guy. So I chose some other topics where I thought that he might do well. Let's see. How about lying? <laughs> the lies of Benghazi, the lies of the IRS and the Tea Party, the lies of military death benefits, an F, excuse me, an A, an A. And I have another one, an A plus for this one. How about you may keep your health plan, period. <laughs> but he's done some other things quite well. He, Golfing and vacations, another A. Now I want you to work with me on this one. <clears throat> if you look at pictures and videos of the president over a long period, always his history, you will see this. 
You see him walking, and this is what you see. Just a normal walk. But now, if you look, when he's getting ready to board the plane or the, the helicopter, this is what you see. It would be funny. But he is masquerading as something that he is not. And that's part of his problem. And part of the nation's problem. He's masquerading as a constitutionalist. When he shreds the Constitution every day, he says that he's a man with a telephone and a pen and he can do whatever he chooses. He's masquerading as someone who cares about our nation. When his spending policies and his foreign policies place us all at risk. So, Mr. President, for your masquerade, for your charade, for your pretending to be something that you are absolutely not, I could give you an A for acting, but I give you an F for masquerading. And there are a couple of others getting along well with others. Obviously, when someone places his ego above the national interest, the interest of a whole nation of people. One man's ego becomes more important than that. He gets an F. Immigration. The president has decided that he wants 46 million new Democrat voters. And so his immigration policies are designed to bring 46 million new Americans onto our shores. Now, we, our hearts and our arms are open, but it, I'm a country boy now. Back in Appaloosa, if there were eight of us in a family and we had one thin chicken, one little fry for supper for eight people, that would not be the time when we would go out and invite the Johnson family and the Robinson family to come and share dinner with us. <laughs> right now, with 46 new million, 46 million new Americans, imagine what will happen to our schools, and we've already talked about our education system. It's fragile. We can't have 46 million new people in our education system, it will not accommodate them. Our hospitals, overcrowded, cannot accommodate 46 million new Americans. Our economic system, Americans are jobless today. 46 million new Americans in our job system, that's ludicrous. And what about our social security system? They're already talking about cutting back on Benefits for those of us who have paid more than a half century paid into the social security system. Now they want to cut back on our benefits. Put 46 million new people into that system and it's going to crumble. Mr. President, for your position on immigration, which is selfish and self-perpetuating, you get an F. Now, any good teacher having a student with all of those Fs would certainly have to put that child, in this, in this case, that man, in time out. <laughs> and we do. We need to put him and everyone who thinks like he thinks and all of the members of his party who think that way, they need to be in time out. My brothers and sisters, we've reached a, a point in American history that every great nation reaches. It's a, a point where it's at the crossroads. We can either go up where great nations dwell, or we can go down into the valley of history and be washed away like ancient Greece, ancient Rome, other great nations. Portugal was once a great nation. Today it's not even a mole here. So we have to decide now whether we're going to go up or go down. 
whether we're going to continue the policies of this present administration. I think that there are three things that we need to do to ensure that we go back up to where America was and where America belongs. The first is that we need to have unity. We must be, as a party, unified. We must grow as a party, stronger, wider, broader. Black folk have a little problem. We've had a problem in our community for a long time. We play a silly game called blacker than thou, who is blacker than whom. There's a church when I was a boy, and that Catholic church, the church had two masses on Sundays, one for medium brown skin black folk, and one for light brown skin black folk. No dark brown skin black folk went to that church at all. They were not welcome. But this whole thing, this division within a community based on, on who's blacker than whom is ridiculous. And we can see that. So, Elbert Guillory comes into the Republican Party. <laughs> and I find that's a liberal Republican. Thank you. There's some conservative Republicans. There's some neoconservative Republicans. There's some liberal Republicans. There's some log cabin Republicans. There are all kinds of red, who is redder than whom is the game. Now, folks, we are family. And what families do is to work out our differences in here. We fuss and fight among ourselves, but when we walk through the door, we are as one fist, composed of many fingers, but one fist, one family, and that's what we need to be when we walk out of this door. So unity is the first thing that we need. The second is that we need to work. Now, I've got to tell you about my cousin, Clovis Fonno, because we cannot be like my cousin. There was a time when he was unprepared. <clears throat> Clovis is from the mother country, from Lottel, Louisiana, <laughs> where all of the Gillers and Fontenot's come from. Clovis went to Mardi Gras in New Orleans once, and he met what is called a New Orleans Creole. Her name was Crustacea. And she talked with her hand on her hips, and she moved her head back and forth when she talked. And he was just mesmerized. They got married, and they're still married. Married for a long time. When they celebrated their 30th anniversary, they went back to New Orleans. Same hotel where they spent their honeymoon. And they were overlooking the Mississippi River and drinking a little champagne, and uh, they kind of got settled in for the evening, and she said, make movies. We're going to do the same thing tonight that we did on our honeymoon, eh? And she said, yeah, yeah. She said, you remember what you did first? You put your arms around me and you squeezed me real tight. And so he did. He put his arms around her and gave her a big squeeze. And then, you remember, you kissed me right on the mouth. And so he did. He puckered up and <laughs> gave her a big kiss. She said, and then, you remember, you bite me right here on my neck. He jumped out and started running. She said, Clovis, Clovis, where are you going? Come back here. He said, I'm going to the bathroom to get my teeth. <laughs> we should never be unprepared. <laughs> As Clovis was on that night. As a party, we have to roll up our sleeves and work and be prepared. This fall, there'll be an election. And we in Louisiana, have a, has, we have a special opportunity and we have a special obligation to this country to send Washington Mary home. Yeah. 
She's one of the main stays. You remember all those F's that we were talking about? She's one of the main supporters of that system with all of those F's. So we must work from the ground up. We have to roll up our sleeves. We have to get the vote out. The last time that Mary Landrieu ran, some of her precincts voted 120%. True. True. 110%, 105%. We're not going to do that, but we're going to keep our eyes on them and make sure they don't do it again. But we're going to get our vote out. We have to expand and become stronger and broader as a party. Finally, my brothers and sisters, we must define Republican in a way that no one else can define it for us. We've, we've sat back too often and let other people say who we are and what we are. It's those Republicans do so and so and so. Those Republicans are such and such and such. We have to step up to the microphone and define Republicanism ourselves. Republicans are the party of small government. We can bring religion back, prayer back into the American public. We can do that. We have to show people that we are the Republican Party, the party that can tell OPEC where to put its oil. And we can open the oil fields of America, North America, Canada. We are a new economic renaissance here. We are the party of freedom. Republicans are the party of less intrusive government. Republicans are the party of economic opportunity and freedom. Republicans are the warriors. Republicans are the protectors of America. Thank you for letting me be with you tonight. God bless you and God bless our homeland.